Hello and a warm welcome to the brand new edition of To the Point. I'm Prithi Mishra, and on today's show, we are joined by Dr. Poonam Khetrapal, Regional Director for Southeast Asia World Health Organization. Dr. Khetrapal, welcome to Rats Bar Television, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Uh, Ma'am, WHO has said that make no mistake, it's a long drawn battle against COVID-19. What's the message, Ma'am? Well, the message is that there should be no complacency. Let us not be off guard because cases are rising. We still don't have medication. We still don't have vaccines. Therefore, we should continue with our social distancing measures. We should be careful that we do not let go at all. All of us, it should be a whole of society approach. It should be whole of people approach. Everybody is in it and everybody must try to see that they contribute their maximum to it. Ma'am, WHO also talks about new normal. What is this new normal that we're talking about? A new normal is that let's get used to living the way we are now. Let's continue to realize that social distancing will be a part of our lives. It will be a new order that we'll be living in. We must try to see that we should avoid overcrowding. We should uh, obey, we should uh, adhere to certain norms when we are interacting socially. So it's a new kind of a way of living. Communities have to get used to it. People have to get used to it. Uh, organizations have to get used to it. The way they will come back after even the lockdown is lifted. Absolutely, ma'am. But talking about India specifically, Prime Minister Narendra Modi extended the lockdown till 3rd of May. How important was this move to flatten the curve of coronavirus? I think it was a very important move and I think it was a very bold move because at that time there were lots of questions being raised about the unorganized labor, about migrants and how would they settle down. So it was extremely important to continue the lockdown so that we didn't lose out on what the lockdown had brought in in the first three weeks. And therefore, I feel that the extension is something that India and the Prime Minister need to be commended for. It is something that is still ongoing. And we will need to see after the lockdown is lifted, what exactly are the benefits the lockdown has brought. But we need to also see at that time that we need to continue with our social distancing measures. Lockdowns are good because they bring physical distance among people. But lockdowns have to also be accompanied by other public health measures. Like we have to continue with the detection of disease. We have to continue with isolation measures. We have to see that contacts are traced. traced. These kind of measures have to continue. And we've seen that India is doing that. We found that testing has gone up appreciably from now and uh, these days, the number of tests have gone up to almost 35,000 a day. We also find that the labs that are testing have increased a lot. We have almost 200 labs in the public sector. We have almost 85 labs in the private sector. So the testing facilities are huge. And not only for India, we are also helping countries around India. And I take care of Southeast Asia, so I do find countries from Southeast Asia also turning to India for testing. So I do think that, yes, this was a good decision at the right time. You talked about the advantages, uh, of course, ma'am, uh, in the first phase of lockdown, that is, that was for 21 days, India aggressively observed lockdown. What were the biggest advantages of that lockdown? Well, the biggest advantage was that, first of all, it was supposed to really bring down the transmission, slow down the transmission. And we do find that the doubling of the cases were reduced. We find that from uh, three, uh, three days of doubling of cases, it has gone up to seven days. That itself is a huge thing. We do find that there are about 61 districts now which really have had no case. And for that reason, I think this has been, uh, the lockdown has contributed. Plus lockdown also helps in flattening the curve. It gives us time to really plan that in case there is a surge of cases after the lockdown is lifted, then 
it gives the government ample time to prepare for that, to see that there are more beds there, there are more ventilators there, that people who are diagnosed with COVID-19 are given the kind of treatment that they need at that time. Right, ma'am. But also, since we're talking about lockdown, we also have to talk about the exit strategy. Now, experts have underscored the need for a graded lifting up of lockdown once we are able to contain the surge in the cases. What kind of strategy do you foresee? Now, you see, when governments open lockdown and there is no one strategy that WHO talks about because each country is different and each uh, the systems of each country, the health system, economic system, social system is very different. In India, we have different states with different health systems. Some have very strong health systems, some do not. And therefore, to have one strategy for the entire country is very difficult. It has to be tailored according to the state in which the lockdown is being lifted. When a lockdown is lifted, there are certain parameters that WHO advocates. And that is that the transmission is controlled. That is the first thing. Second is that the health system capacities, which I mentioned, are in place. That in case there is a surge, that can be dealt with. Third is that outbreak risks in health settings have been minimized. We need to keep an eye on that. That preventive measures are implemented, that what I referred to, that in case, you know, it's not just bringing a lockdown. There are lots of other things that are associated with it which need to continue. So it doesn't mean that testing has to go down or slow down. It doesn't mean that identification of these cases and then uh, treating them has to go down. It doesn't mean that we don't have to isolate cases. We don't have to find contacts of these cases and quarantine them. All these public health measures have to be in place when lockdowns are lifted. Secondly, the importation risks have to be managed and communities have to be fully educated and fully empowered and ready to be able to be adjusting to a situation after lockdown because everything perhaps would not open. It would be a gradual kind of a lifting of the lockdown. And therefore, those who are going to be affected and chiefly the communities at the peripheral level, those who do not you know, have the, uh, let's say the economic status to be able to manage a lockdown situation, those who are living in very crowded kind of uh, housing, those communities have to be ready to uh, deal with the, lock the opening of the lockdown in the best possible way. So empowerment and knowledge of the communities also is very important. Absolutely, ma'am. You're making a very important point that empowerment and knowledge, these are very important components. But ma'am, talking about uh, this speculation or this conjecture that heat or humidity will kill the virus, could you please clarify there's a lot of talk about it, and you hear a lot about it in the media also. However, there is no such evidence which goes to say that with rising temperatures, COVID-19 will go down. We have no such evidence in WHO. All right, ma'am. Uh, moving ahead and talking about uh, the vaccine for uh, COVID-19. Now, several countries are testing uh, the vaccines. We've also uh, been hearing about trials in humans. Where does the world stand today? on the vaccine of coronavirus? Well, since we all realize that vaccines is the only way forward really to be able to manage this disease, uh, and there is no vaccine at the moment, and vaccine is not produced in a day, we all know it has a time period and we have to wait and adhere to that time period because whatever vaccine comes out has to be safe to be given to the communities. And therefore, it is important that we are ready to give that kind of timeline to the development of the vaccines. Now, there is the government of India is focusing a lot on it. And after the prime minister's call, to the scientists of the country to come ahead with vaccine, we do find that there is an acceleration of activity in that area. There are vaccines that are being worked upon. Uh, there is, uh, There are some candidate vaccines which are also working with countries outside India, and those are mostly in the private sector. Uh, so we do hope that 
by with, with the well normally the period we are looking for is 12 months but there are uh, organizations there are national governments there are certain pharmaceutical companies vaccine producing companies which are saying that they should be able to bring out something by the end of this year yet we don't know whether that will happen they have gone into human trials and then we have to watch and see what the human trials really bring forth. Now, as far as WHO is concerned, we do have a solidarity trial. We have not yet announced it. We are working on it. We have a solidarity trial for medications, which is underway where many countries around the world are participating in. And they are working on four different medications. But for vaccines, we still have to have an accelerated kind of a vaccine solidarity uh, mechanism by which we will be able to see what different, which are the different candidates for vaccine production. How can we bring them together to share their knowledge and information? In the region itself, we are taking steps to see how countries of the region, and I name three there, which are prominent and which are showing a lot of interest in vaccine production. I named India before. We also have Thailand, which is showing interest. We have Indonesia. These are the three countries which have the capacity and which have the interest to go ahead and see how they can pull in their information and come up with a vaccine which will be able to protect the people from COVID-19. Right, ma'am. That's a, another important point that you're making. But Let's be sanguine that we find a vaccine uh, for this invisible enemy. Of course, at the United Nations, India has also supported a resolution for equitable distribution of the vaccine. How would the equitable distribution be ensured across countries? Well, you see, this has been a subject of debate, not only in the United Nations. Before that, it has been a subject of intense debate in the World Health Organization. And that happened after SARS when a vaccine was produced, but then the developing world did not have access to that vaccine. And it was Indonesia chiefly, which was uh, anxious about it because Indonesia felt that the virus was taken from their country and yet the vaccine that was produced was not available to that country. So after that, there was a lot of debate in the World Health Organization where the main principle of the debate was equal sharing of the benefits of whatever vaccine was produced. And today, if we look at different countries around the world, we do find that there are countries which are going ahead with compulsory licensing, and that is mostly in the drug field where there has been uh, under the TRICS agreement an agreement to see that compulsory licensing can be invoked. And if there is technical knowledge and a vaccine is produced, then under these agreements that I mentioned, countries, other countries, apart from those which are involved in producing the vaccines, would also stake a claim to the sharing of those vaccines. Right, so it's a long drawn way and we just hope that we get the vaccines as soon as possible. But moving on, ma'am, how is WHO working with World Economic Forum to engage companies around the world to protect staff and also to ensure economic stability? Now, we have seen that uh, now COVID-19 is not only related to the health sector or not only affecting doctors, nurses and the communities at large. It is having a great effect on the businesses as yeah. well. We have seen that businesses have got affected, trade has got affected, the economies of countries have got affected. And therefore, they also need attention. And there's a need to get all stakeholders together. So the World Economic Forum is working with WHO and has created a platform whereby we would give uh, uh, attention to businesses around the world, to other stakeholders, which are also affected from the fallout of COVID-19. The World Economic Forum, apart from that, apart from what it's doing with WHO, it has also set up a South Asia kind of uh, uh, initiative for, uh, on which they have invited different leaders from around the world. In fact, incidentally, there's a meeting, the first meeting of it today, and I'm also participating there. They're trying to get various people around the world from 
you know, political leadership, other leadership. They're trying to get business uh, houses involved. They're trying to get the private sector involved so that all understand the problems that are being faced by businesses and what exactly can be done by different stakeholders to alleviate that problem. Right, ma'am. But How uh, can we cooperate? Yes. Basically, that is the push. This is a time when everybody has to work collectively and cooperatively to address the various ills coming out of COVID-19. So these are various platforms to see how can we get together to address that problem. Absolutely, ma'am. And taking a cue from what you said, uh, we understand that the outbreak of 2019 novel coronavirus is a public health emergency of international concern. But how do we ensure highest level of international solidarity and cooperation to protect health and keep people safe in all times to come? When this, yes, as you rightly point out, that this was declared as a public health emergency of international concern uh, at the end of January. I think it was on the 30th of January that this was announced. And after that, in March, it became a pandemic. And we have seen that this is one of those pandemics where every country around the world, not every, almost every country around the world is affected. And therefore, it becomes a global issue. It's a global issue today. There is a need for PPEs, the personal protective equipment, which is not available. And there is now, of course, initiatives, and I commend India again on it, because India is trying to see how they can involve their own industry in manufacturing what is really needed most at this time. There is also a lot of cooperation among countries. Countries are trying to see how they help each other. How can they get together on a common platform and respond to each other's needs? And I find a lot of that happening through the WHO, through other forums, but also bilaterally with countries. Like, for example, India helped out some countries in airlifting their students from different, where, different countries where they were held up. We also find that India came forth and with hydrochloroquine and gave it to different countries, 66 countries around the world. So these are just examples to show how the world is responding to this. At the moment, there is a need for that kind of cooperation. And we find the Indian government, I find various other forums going out of the way, whether we look at G20, whether we look at G77, whether we look at the World Bank, whether we look at the Asian Development Bank, all these development banks, institutions, various bilaterals are all coming forth to see how is it that they can help? How can the world respond to this very major COVID-19, a crisis which is unprecedented? Nobody thought it would take this shape. It has, and it gets accentuated because we have no thera therapeutics at the moment and we have no vaccine. And that makes it even more important for people to work collectively together. Absolutely, ma'am. And since uh, you represent uh, the entire Southeast Asia region at the World Health Organization, how do you see the fight in this region against coronavirus? Well, I find that people are well geared for it. I find countries of the region taking important steps for it. And if you look at the Southeast Asia region, the transmission has not been as explosive as in some other regions of the world where it has been really bad. So I put it down to the political will of the countries of my region. I put it down to their immediate steps, some very bold and urgent steps which they took, like physical distancing, lockdowns, which came very early in many, many countries of the region. And therefore, countries of our region understood, saw what was going around the world, and learned from that and took immediate steps. So there is a feeling of camaraderie in the region. I do organize forums where the health ministers of the region get together on a VC and they exchange information, they exchange the status of coronavirus. They also talk to each other about what they are doing. They share experiences so that one can learn from the other. I have set up a WhatsApp group of ministers so that when, when they want to share something important or when there is important information, it can be shared with them. We are using our Facebook, we are using our WhatsApp regularly to update our region. 
So we are not just, uh, it's not just ministers that we are referring to. We do think that, yes, it's important to have very important leadership at the top. And therefore, all ministers of my region are well dead and are giving that kind of leadership, which is really like leading to a situation where when we compare ourselves from the rest of the world, we feel that at present, we still do not have that kind of rapid transmission. And I do feel that other social distancing measures that different countries have brought in where labs have been set in some countries like Maldives requested for labs and we were quick to see that they do have lab capacity to be able to test the cases because that's the core. We do need to do that to be able to identify cases that then need to be quarantined, that need to be kept separately, that we need to then find out the contacts of those cases. So the whole machinery is so well geared today. We find even on the research front, the ICMR doing commendable work. We find in our own country, like the ICMR has reached out to other countries of the region also. They have provided a regional platform. We find Niti Aayog doing its bit, really going out of the way to see how the right policy interventions are made, how they can come ahead very quickly after studying what is going around in different countries of the world and give good advice. So I do feel that countries of this region are really taking the right steps. And we are then there to support them in every possible way. They do ask us for PPEs because that is a real problem. They do ask us for lab equipment. They ask us for primers. And uh, the World Health Organization office in Geneva are locked, are, uh, you know, we, we have different setups. Ours is in Dubai, our go down from where we get uh, these kind of uh, equipment or we get primers to be able to support different countries of our region. So we are trying to augment the lab capacity. We are trying to see that they do get what they need so that they are empowered to be able to deal with this, this uh, disease. Absolutely. Dr. Ketrubal, and lastly, but one of the most important aspects, uh, something that the WHO also said that our greatest enemy right now is not just the virus itself. It's fear, rumor, and stigma. Talking about the Southeast Asian region, how do we control these rumors and fake news? You're right that, yes, at the moment, there's so much going about, you know, on, uh, on this disease that people don't know really what to believe and what not to believe. And rumors can cause a lot of damage. And we've seen that happening here and as elsewhere. It's happening all over the world. And therefore, what we are trying to do is give correct information to people. We are trying, we have our website, which we update every day to see that the right information is there. People come to it and get information which is authentic. That is why we are very careful to only put evidence-based information there so that we do not spread anything which is not backed by science or backed by evidence. We also use our WhatsApp very frequently. We get questions, we respond to them. We get, we use our Facebook. We just to see that, yes, people do get the right information and people do not fall for information which is false. So they do have to have some place where they can go to for correct information. And wherever we see that there is false information being spread, and there have been instances of that, we are very quick to contradict that and to say that this is not what WHO is saying. Because I have found two instances where WHO was wrongly quoted. And therefore, it didn't take us much time to go back and say that this is not what WHO is saying. And I must commend again that the Indian government also picked it up and they were very quick to deny that and to say that this is not authentic information from WHO. So I feel this is very important, one, to give correct information and two, where there is incorrect information to immediately go and say that this is not right. Right, Pam. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us on that note and sharing those valuable inputs with us, ma'am. And all the best in your endeavor and WHO's endeavor to fight COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ketrupa.